Welcome to our TV news tonight. My name is Atini Machali and here are our top stories. Members of staff at Rhodes University stand up against the interdict. Rhodes University's task team responds to students' demands against rape culture. An unidentified man stabs a local musician outside Triple S Top Bar. Good evening. Students and staff members at Rhodes University have voiced their concerns over the interim interdict. The interdict is viewed as a tool that is used to prevent protesting. Mithalin Zabo reports. Although the recent student protests against rape culture at Rhodes University attracted much needed media attention, this led to the university filing a temporary interdict against student protests on campus. The interdict was taken out on April 20 this year after a brutal collision between student protesters and the police force against the blocking of roads on campus and disruption of academic activities. Dr. Cesar Mabizela, Rhodes University Vice Chancellor, explains to us what the interim order is about. This is an interim interdict. Okay, I think one needs to understand this. An interim interdict, or an interdict more generally, is an order of the court. Uh, the, order of the, the order of the court, which in our context, reminds us as a community about our rights and our responsibilities. Dr. Mabizela further explains why the interim interdict was filed. That interdict clearly indicates that everyone has a right to a peaceful protest within the bounds of the law. So, and that is a constitutionally enshrined right. So no court can take that away. 38 out of the 85 concerned Rhodes University staff members appeared at the Grahamstown High Court against the finalizing of the interdict. The end result, the interim order has been postponed until the 1st of September this year. We want to negotiate with the university. We have been trying to negotiate with the university for a long time now, and we would like that to continue. Um, ideally, we would like to come to an agreement to withdraw the interdict, or at least to um, have an end date to the interdict. Rhodes University staff members have also attempted to talk management out of the interdict. As a group of concerned staff, we have already sent the, uni the university management three letters trying to engage in dialogue and pointing out to them that the interdict is not preventing criminal activity on campus. It is creating it is stifling dissent, it is stifling debate, it is stifling political activity on campus. The interim, this interdict, it should not stake. Um, and hopefully on the 1st of September when the, because it's been, you know, moved to then, hopefully, you know, the, 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 the courts will actually hear us um, and not um, let it stake. Because there was absolutely no violence, there was absolutely no grounds for the interdict to stake. There was no death threats. We don't know anything about the basis of the, the interdict. But all we know is that um, as much as management claims that it, it's there for the rights, to protect our rights, it's, it's protecting the rights of the majority. And what about us, the minority, who are still being silenced? While the vice chancellor emphasizes that the interdict was taken out to protect the rights of students, some Rhodes University staff members beg to differ, seeing it as a silencing tactic. Now the question remains, will the interdict fall or will the law deem it permanent? This is Michal Intzaba for RTV News Tonight, Rhodes University, Grahamstown. Earlier this year, students protesting at Rhodes University against rape culture made demands, one of which was for an interim task team to be formed. The task team was set to ensure that rape cases and other matters relating to sexual assault are dealt with immediately. Rhodes University students take a stand against rape culture. The names of alleged rapists on Facebook sparked anger and outrage from students who went on to call for immediate action from management. University management responded by setting up a task team headed by Professor Katrina McLeod. Our research is a lot around sexualities and some of our research is also on sexual violence and gender-based violence. We were happy to, to facilitate the um, establishment of this task team. Now what's important about this task team is to, to, to realise that the mandate that the task team has is not a mandate that has been uh, um, set up by management, for example, or any particular uh, group of, 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 of people on the, at the university. I think it's great that um, 
be so we're gonna be the guinea pigs for all other universities to sort of learn something or you know take what our work forward. Despite all the work that the task team has achieved, Professor McLeod explains that they have experienced a few challenges along the way. One of the things that people have said is that people in the counselling centre are often not properly equipped to deal with people who have experienced sexual violence. And there is polarisation on the campus, and so we, 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 you know, we need to hear what people are saying about processes and things that happen during the protest itself. So the task team's estimated deadlines for meeting their seven mandates range from the end of June until the end of October this year. I'm Tulufelo Zalamang for RTV News Tonight. Grandstown. We're joined in studio by reporter Tulufelo Zelaimang. Good evening and thank you for joining us, Tolo. Thank you for having me, Ati. Um, do you mind teasing out some of the mandates set by the rape culture at Rose University? So um, the rape culture task team basically has seven mandates which were decided on by the student and staff volunteers which make up the task team. And these mandates range from um, reviewing um, sexual offences policies at Rhodes, recommending ways in which the... Um, curriculum can include issues related to sexual violence, as well as creating safe spaces on campus where students and survivors can go voice their experiences. What has the task team been able to achieve so far? Okay, so there have been about two stages to the creation of the task team. So the first stage was the interim task team, which was set up by management during the rape culture protests. And then that task team gave way to the current task team. Basically what they've done from the interim task team is get more volunteers, students and staff, to form the current task team. And now this current task team has been divided into seven different groups to deal with the individual mandates. It seems like the task team is showing some progress. Thank you for joining us, Tulu Fellow, and moving on to our next headline. An unidentified man attacked Graham star musician Craig Albers outside Triple S Bar. The musician who was leaving the bar was stabbed three times but managed to escape alive. Tess Miles reports. Good evening. Two weeks ago, an unidentified man attacked musician Craig Albers outside SSS Top Bar here on New Street. The incident happened as Craig was headed towards a car at 10.30 at night. My friend was playing a show here. Uh, we left at about half past 10. We got into a car, well, we were going to a car which was parked across the road. Uh, when we were about halfway across the road, this guy appeared behind us and he asked us for a lift. I asked him where he wants to lift to. He said, 100 meters down the road. I told him, no, dude, you can walk. It's a bit strange for someone to ask you to lift that far. Got in the car and he was standing still next to me and he kind of held the door open, stabbed me about three times and then ran away into the darkness. I was inside, um, inside Slipstream. Um, there was a commotion. The people came and called me and told me what happened. Went out. We got Craig inside quickly. And then we, we got people to call the ambulance and the police. I feel the streets of Grahamstown at night are very poorly lit. Um, High Street, New Street, um, completely too dark. One of the things I think that will help very quickly is if we had to have adequate lighting in these areas. Um, I myself have put on two big spotlights on the outside of Slipstream to light up the area outside Slipstream, which has helped a little bit as well. I was leaving fires about 11.30 uh, in the evening. I was actually meeting up with a friend who was going to walk me home, and then I turned into High Street. I heard running behind me and I turned around and then just two guys were on me and the one guy grabbed my arms and the other guy started using, because my bag was across my body like that, I started using it to try and like strangle me and get it off at the same time by really bad anxiety as it is, but I, I literally couldn't sleep. Like it's so cliche, but I woke up screaming quite a few times. I've definitely considered doing self-defense classes and I'm definitely buying pepper spray. If I don't have pepper spray, I'm just completely ha helpless. So I think it sort of puts me in a situation to sort of defend myself in a way, even though it might not always be effective. Students like Lindiwe often have to walk home at night, which is becoming more dangerous. Pepper spray, tasers and self-defense classes are a way of helping students defend themselves. I think the class uh, 
the seminar come to be because of all these factors like violence that has been happening around Grahamstown in general. During sign up, pe most people would come saying they need to be able to, to say, de defend themselves, especially here in Grahamstown. It's more frequent and now there's, um, it's starting to become more violent and that's, that's what worries me a lot because somebody is going to get seriously hurt one day and then, and then only then will somebody do something, I think. With Disability Week underway, Professor Leslie Schwartz from Stellenbosch University is giving a talk on mental disability. The talk will be at Eden Grove Blue and will focus on disability, learning and accessibility. Dumi by Bani reports. Disability is not only about the body, there are ranges of, of, of uh, impairments, including what we call psychosocial disability and, and so on. And disability studies and disability politics is not about what the body looks like, but about social processes around different bodies. Looking at disabilities and accessibility around roads as campus, there are some changes that we can see. But the inclusion of ramps as well as elevators is not enough to raise awareness around disabilities. Located in the admin building is the Office of Equity and Institutional Culture. The office focuses on issues of transformation and has been working towards creating a space in which both students and staff can freely disclose and live with a disability. I think all we need to do is really stretch our definition of disability and then we'll realize that all of us in one way or the other have a disability. For somebody who's got a mental disability, what does it mean in terms of their processing? What does it mean in terms of our assessment? You know, are we assessing them in the same way that we would assess somebody else? What we have tried to introduce, and this has been introduced successfully in the past two or three years, is that if on the actual application form to roads there is an insert which is aimed at persons with a disability who want to disclose. The disability is the inability to participate. It is not that the person themselves are coming with a particular, you know, they may have a mental impairment, which is, which is, is a physical situation. It's a, their ability, it's either a brain processing power, it's a psychological impact, all of those are particular impairments. But what then makes them disabilities is when our institution is unable to provide alternative reasonable accommodation to those students. I have depression, anxiety, PTSD, and I also suffer from like mild paranoia. The universal approach of disabilities sets to ensure that people with mental disabilities are accommodated in social spaces. Our correspondent to me by Bani is join, joining us in studio, excuse me. Do me what in fact counts as a mental disability? Well, according to the social definition of mental disability, or rather disability, um, what counts as a disability is you not being able to um, engage in society, I guess, or in a certain space in the way in which you are expected to. So a mental disability in this instance would be something that um, prevents you from engaging with other people. And an example that... Um, is more understandable is of in the teaching space when you are unable to um, process information like everybody else or as expected then that can count as a mental disability. Um, have there been students who have actually come forward to state that they do indeed have a mental disability at Rhodes? Yes definitely I mean um, we've had about a um, hundred odd students who have um, indicated that they have disabilities and if you look around campus um, there aren't a hundred odd students who have physical disabilities. So from that statistic alone, you can almost safely conclude that these are students who have mental disabilities. What would you say are measures put in place by the institution to make sure that Rhodes as a whole is a space that accommodates um, students with mental disabilities? Mm. Um, currently there exists um, the counselling centre, which of course is um, an avenue which um, students who have depression, for instance, can use to deal with their depression. Um, right now, the university is looking towards universal um, tools to implement, such as audiobooks, I guess, for students who are blind and for students who are unable to process information as quickly as they're expected to. So um, 
having this universal approach is actually for the benefit of everybody. And in the long run, then there won't be cases of why has this not been done yet. Um, so yeah, the university is still working on that. Thank you very much, Tumi. Coming up after the break is Sports with Muchemo Sinkala. <laughs> The South African Broadcasting Corporation, SABC, has secured the right to broadcast the 2016 UEFA Champions League. The games will take place on the 10th of July and will be broadcast on both television and radio channels. Former Chelsea football club coach Jose Mourinho is set to sign a £10 million contract with Manchester United. The Portuguese coach will be the third manager at Old Trafford in three years and will replace Louis van Gaal, who was sacked on Monday. Mamledi Sundowns are officially PSL champions after beating Platinum Stars 1-0 at the Lucas Moripi Stadium Saturday night. The champions end off the season with 71 points under their belt and 14 points led over second place Bidfest Vitz. This is all for your sports news this evening. Back to you, Atimi. Thank you very much, Muchemo. And uh, that is all we have for this evening. I'm Atini Majali and this is RUTV News Tonight. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.